Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. According to NobelPrize.org, Albert Einstein was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1921 for his services to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. However, Alfred Nobel had certain criteria, and it was outlined in his will. It was determined that none of the candidates met the criteria that year, so Einstein was actually given his award in the following year. This is just one controversy from 1921, including another Einstein presented his theory of relativity. In this week's episode, we get to answer the question we left off with last week. What happened in that 1921 championship controversy? And it all revolved around a Buffalo's first NFL team. They were called the All-Americans. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, The date is December 4th, 1921, and we are at a game between the Chicago Staleys and the Buffalo All-Americans. These are two teams that we don't recognize now. We recognize the cities, but we don't recognize those last names. Now, the Chicago Staleys would turn into the Bears, but the Buffalo All-Americans would just fade away into nothingness. However, we had to talk about the 1921 NFL championship game. There was a controversy, and that's where we left off last week's episode. This is the second part of an interview with Jeff Miller. Now, mind you, this is not the NFL at the time yet. It's still considered the American Professional Football Association. But we're going to jump right back into that interview to hear from Jeff what really happened in 1921 to cover this controversy. Now, just as a reminder for you, Jeff is a Buffalo historian, but he focuses really on Buffalo and early professional football. But he also authored many other Buffalo Bills books, so he has a wealth and diverse knowledge base when it comes to Buffalo history. I mean, including one of the books that he had, it was co-authored with legendary coach Marv Levy. But that first two seasons, they were arguably the best team in the league. I mean, 1921 season two, they had uh, uh, what I'll call a championship controversy. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, the All-Americans, you know, their, their, their owner, Frank McNeil, um, they, were, they were doing really well in 1921. They got through the first nine games of the season at nine, or what was it, eight, oh, and one. And um, McNeil decided that he was going to declare him his team champions. So after they played the Dayton Triangles on, uh, I believe it was November 27th, he came out and said, we're undefeated. We're, we're uh, the champions. And f- as far as I'm concerned, the season's over. Well, the league had not declared an end date for the season at that point. So other teams kept playing. And in the meantime, he received a challenge from George Hallis who was the owner and coach of the Chicago Steelers at the time, who the All-Americans had defeated earlier in the year, asking them for a rematch. And uh, Frank McNeil, to his everlasting chagrin, agreed to play him. And in McNeil's mind, it was supposed to be a exhibition game. But Hallis had other ideas. He thought, he thought well, you know, the league is um, 
has not declared an, an end date. So we're going to keep playing games and they kept playing. So they, not only did they play the all Americans and beat them the one in the, in the rematch, but they played a couple more games. But what happened was when the, the all Americans went to play Chicago on, on the last game of the season, as far as the, you know, the, the league now recognizes, which would have been December 4th, they had played again, the Akron pros on Saturday before and defeated them quite soundly, 14 to nothing, and then got on a train and drove all night to play the next day in Chicago. They played Chicago and lost. George Hallis declared, hey, we're the championships. We won the second game of the series. Therefore, we're the champions. Well, McNeil, he insisted, no, this is just an exhibition. But the league said, no, we, somewhere between that time, they had declared that the, the last day of the season would be December 4th. So they counted all league, all games played up until December 4th to be uh, not exhibition, but you know, actual games. So what happened was Hallis ended up with a record of 9-1-1. One, and one. The All-Americans ended up with a record of 9-1-2. and two. The league sided with George Hallis against McNeil. So Hallis had his first of how many championships and the All-Americans and the city of Buffalo lost their first chance at a championship. And of course, Buffalo has not won an NFL championship since. So (laughs) (laughs) that's our, you know, that's our first in many disappointments here in the city of Buffalo. Yeah. It's just crazy to think how they scheduled things back in the day. I mean, now we know, I don't know, four or five years in the future, whatever it is on this date is when the Super Bowl is going to be played in what city and what stadium and everything like that. Well, in 1921, even that was the second year of the league and they were still playing, you know, sandlot football teams, you know, semi-pro football teams. So the league was still allowing teams to play those games for several years. And, you know, you, you would think that if they wanted to be truly major league, truly professional, they wouldn't be allowing this to happen, but they did because, you know, the teams needed the revenue. They, they'd go out. So the all Americans might go out and play some scrub team from Tonawanda or from, or, or a semi pro team from Rochester, just, just to make a few dollars, you know, that they had to pay their guys to play and make a little money on the side. So, um, that was the practice. Yeah. A little bit different. I mean, ultimately it changed and now we're where we're at a hundred years later and the Buffalo All Americans, you know, they had those two great years, but then they just seemed to fall to the middle of the pack after that. What do you think happened there? Well, when you look at the first five seasons, uh, where they were the All Americans and then became the Bisons in 1924, they had a winning percentage of 69.4 under Tommy Hewitt, the head coach. So they won 34 games and only lost 15. They were a formidable team in that, in the first five years of that league. So, you know, they're really, it's really hard to say that, you know, there, there was a reason why they, they declined because they were still good. I think once you got to 1925, 1924, 25, what happened at that point was ownership changed hands and they started bringing in a lot more sandlotters. You didn't see all Americans, too many all Americans playing for this team by that time. And so the talent pool was shriveling. The, um, the competitive level of the team was, was dwindling. They were playing teams that were getting much better. You know, Chicago Bears were now here. The New York Giants were here. You know, Duluth Eskimos with Ernie Nevers. There were some good teams out there now, and we were playing them with a bunch of sandlotters on our team. So we had become the team that we were, the team, you know, that we were crushing before. That's, that's the team that we became. So once that happened, there was no more money. You know, they, the, the, uh, they couldn't bring in the players, so they couldn't sell the tickets. Uh, the Great Depression happens. You know, the world, the stock market crashes in 1929. And after that, there's no more teams. So there were a lot of things that were going against this team after about 1924, 25. But those first five years, the Buffalo All Americans, Bisons were a phenomenal team. Yeah. And then, uh, when was their last season? Their last season was 1929. They had taken 1928 off because, uh, they, again, they weren't doing very well in 1927. They didn't seem to have a lot of interest around here. They were bringing in maybe 2,500 to 3,000 people to, into the stadium for every game. So they took a year off, and then they came back in 1929, and they didn't do much better. They only won one game. They lost seven, and then they folded up shop after that. And then City of Buffalo, no more professional teams until the Bills in the 60s, or was there any kind of like spattling here and there? There were a couple of minor league teams uh, that came through Buffalo. 
There was an American Football League in the 1940s, and Buffalo had teams uh, in 1940 and 41. And then there was the All America Football Conference, which came in 1946, where the you know a lot of the teams that we know today, like the Cleveland Browns, San Francisco 49ers, um, and um, what was the other team? Baltimore came came out of that league and merged with the NFL. Buffalo played in that league. They were actually very good. They made the playoffs a couple of years, but when the, the uh, NFL swallowed that league up, they didn't take Buffalo in. So Buffalo didn't have a team throughout the fifties. We didn't have another professional team until 1960 when the AFL came in and the Buffalo bills under Ralph Wilson, um, they were established and then they were an AFL team though. But, so their two championships are not considered major league by some football historians. So when you're talking about Buffalo's major league franchise franchises, winning championships, that uh, championship team of 1964 and 65 is not counted. So Buffalo's never won a National Football League championship. Yeah, but it still has some pretty uh, loyal fans there, don't you? Oh, Buffalo's a very rabid football city. The, the, you have the Bills Mafia, uh, which is a bunch of crazy people who love the game and love the, love the team and show their loyalty in many <laughs> interesting and exciting ways. But um, just the, the fan base is nationwide. If you go to pretty much any city across the country, you can find a Bills bar. You can find a Bills bar in Miami. You can find a Bills bar in Philadelphia, in, in Virginia, in California, in Green Bay, in, in Dallas. There's Bills bars everywhere because so many people have left Buffalo or, or they have retired to the South. So there's a lot of people that just have gone somewhere else for warmer climates or whatever, or maybe some financial opportunity, but they've moved to another part of the country and they've maintained their loyalty to the Buffalo Bills and bar owners have established uh, establishments across the country dedicated to the Buffalo Bills. It's just, it's just a rabid following. Well, across the nation then, I mean, I'll be one of them. I'm rooting for the Bills this week against the Texans for you. (laughs) Yeah, they're, I think we have a really good chance. We we match up very well against them. Uh, their defense is a little suspect. We have one of the best defenses in the league, so I think that uh, we have a really good chance of beating them and advancing into the playoffs. Well, I hope so. I mean, that's uh, something that, as a Lions fan, I always root for the teams like that that haven't had a whole lot of success in recent memory. You know, and you do know that the Bills were, um, you know, their, their original colors were modeled after the Lions, correct? I did not know that. Yeah, when when Ralph Wilson came to Buffalo to start the Bills, he had actually been a a minority stockholder in the Detroit Lions. So when he came to Buffalo, Buffalo's first uniforms were Honolulu blue and silver, which were the Lions colors. And he actually brought in Buster Ramsey, who had been a coach with the Lions, and he brought Eddie Abramoski, who had also been with the Lions organization as a as a trainer. So he brought a lot of players um, who had been on the Lions roster here as well. He really had a, you know, like a soft spot in his heart for the city of Detroit where he lived, you know, or not, he didn't live in, he didn't live in Detroit, but he lived in Gross Point, which is nearby. So he's lived, he lived in Michigan all his life and um, always had a soft spot for Detroit and the Detroit Lions. We almost always play them in the exhibition season before the season too, because there's just some kind of connection there. Huh. Yeah. And I mean, I knew we always played. I didn't realize there was the historical reference for it though. Uh, I guess we can say that we're uh, brothers in a sense from a different sure. way. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Plus, we're long-suffering. We, we, you guys haven't won a championship since 57, <laughs> and we have never. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's a tough one to swallow. But speaking of going back again to the All-Americans, uh, kind of bring it full circle here with uh, Swede Youngstrom with, with the All-Americans. Are there any other players or coaches, you know, like notables that you wanted to bring up? Sure. Um, there's a couple. I love Tommy Hewitt. Tommy Hewitt is an interesting story because not only was he uh, the coach and quarterback of the team, but in 1924, he actually became a part owner and he owned a stock in the team for a couple of years. But after that, he became a very well-known and respected referee in the, in the national football league. So he, he's actually was cited by some players for being a pioneer in improved race relations because he coached in the AA in the, or he refereed, I'm sorry, in the uh, American conference, Marion Motley made a comment about how Hewitt would actually run into the pile and, and pull some of the white players off of Motley and the other black players 
when, cause you know, when they were being tackled in those days, there was a lot of racism in the league and guys would give them a, an extra kick or an extra punch or, you know, you scratch their eyes or something. So Hewitt was very vigilant about making sure that kind of thing didn't continue. So he's, he's one of my personal favorites. Another is uh, a gentleman named Luke Urban. Luke Urban was an All-American end at Boston College, and um, he came to the All-Americans in 1920, or 1921, I'm sorry. And he played here for only three years, but he was an All-Pro for all three seasons he played here. The interesting thing about him is that after he finished playing professional football, he became a Major League Baseball player. He played for the Boston Braves as a catcher in 1927 and 28. And here's an even more interesting twist. He was an actual pro in three sports. He was a professional golfer as well. So, you know, take that Bo Jackson and Deion Sanders because we had a guy here in Buffalo <laughs> who played professionally in three sports. And on top of that, he was also a successful coach um, here at local college of Canisius College of Buffalo. So he's a pretty fascinating guy. And, you know, we had some other players here that were pretty pretty important. We had Lud Ray, who was uh, an All-American from Penn, and he was later the first head coach of the Boston Braves NFL team, which later became the Washington Redskins. And then Lou Little was also a tackle here for the first couple of years, and he went on to be a very well-known head coach at Columbia University. He was there for over 25 years, 27 years, something like that. So we had some players here who were pretty famous. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Three, three sport professional and three, yeah. Peter? Yeah, I, I brought that up because we have a local sports hall of fame here in Buffalo and he's not in it. And I've brought that up to some of the electors here and they just, you know, I, I've pretty much been told that, you know, he's not well known enough and well, okay, well he should be. And maybe if he got elected to the local hall of fame, he would be, but as, at this point he's not. So. Yeah, that's crazy. I, <laughs> I, I mean, it seems it's a, it's for Buffalo. It's not just because of a particular sport or anything. Right. right. Yeah. He, yeah. And, and when you think about it, he was a, he played locally football here, but when he played for the Boston Braves there, you know, he also played his minor league baseball here for the Buffalo Bisons when, you know, we had a minor league team in those days. And, um, you know, he coached at Canisius college. So he's, he really made his mark here in Buffalo. Yeah. I'm, to me, that seems like a no-brainer as well. But again, going back to, like you said, with the 1920s players, a lot of people don't know about it, so they don't have the notoriety. So then they don't sell as many seats, I guess you could say, to the Hall of Fame inductions or whatever. But uh, speaking of going back to the 20s, uh, one thing I like to always ask the guests of the show is I'm going to give you the keys to my DeLorean. You can go back in history, any point in history, and you can be a witness to experience it firsthand, but you can't change the outcome. What event are you going to go see? Well, I, I, for me, because I'm a, I'm a Bills fan and, a, and I've written a book about the Bills American League years, um, I'd like to go back to 1964 and attend the American Football League Championship game that year where they defeated San Diego. But I, I think it would be so fascinating to be able to go back in time and watch a game in, during the 1920s, say 1921, where these guys were wearing leather helmets and they were playing in mud and they were playing with a big, fat, melon-shaped football and the rules were different. I just think that that would be such a fascinating thing to watch. I, I love I loved single-wing football. I love I love the mud and muck. I love the, the, the way these guys were, you know, played a game, whether they were hurt or whether, you know, they never came off the field. Most of them were 60-minute performers. I, I would just love to see an actual game in that era. So if you were sitting in, I mean, they probably didn't have box scores or, you know, like the press boxes or whatever, but if you could sit there next to Frank McNeil during a, <laughs> during a game and ask him a question, what kind of question would you ask him? I, I, I guess I would, I would ask him, what do we got to do to keep this team together? What, what can we do to make sure this team doesn't dissolve? You know, I don't know if McNeil wanted to self because he wasn't making money or he just wasn't interested anymore. I don't know what his motivation was for selling the team, but if there was some way to keep this team going so that we could have been one of those teams like the Chicago bears or the New York giants or the green Bay Packers who made it through the depression and made it through the thirties and forties and then came out and are now one of the billion dollar franchises of this league. I just wish there was a way we could have that connection to that team going all the way through. 
you know, if there's some way you could have talked McNeil into sticking with it or whatever, I just, that, that would have been, that would have been something to be able to do to, to just, you know, say, stick it out, stick it out. You eventually you're going to make millions. It's just going to take some time. George Hallis did. He stuck it through from 1920 to the day, you know, his death in 1983 or whatever it was, you know, he was a millionaire by the time he died. You know, a lot of these, you know, the, the, the Maras who owned the giants from 1925 on, they're still in the family. So, you know, it's, it's possible. You know, if he would have just stuck it out, who knows what could have happened. Yeah, considering that they had such a good team. And like you said, their record was like 60% or whatever it was in the first four or five years. Yeah, six, they won 69% of their games in the first five years. So, yeah, they were very successful. So just imagine if they would have stuck around. I mean, the the Buffalo fans or, like you said, the mafia. And <laughs> yeah. they would have just been, they would have probably been one of the dominant teams in the NFL in the early years. And then throughout when the AFL came around, the Bills probably wouldn't have been there. We wouldn't have had to have a American Football League franchise. We would have been one of those teams in the National Football League that would have been, you know, telling the AFL owners to go away, you know. But, yeah, <laughs> right. but you know, the Bills Mafia or whatever we're called, if we're called the Bisons or whatever, you know, we would be the Bisons Mafia. We would be <laughs> the All-Americans Mafia, mm-hmm. whatever. You know, the, the Buffalo fans are rabid about their sport. It's it's not just about the players on this team. It's it's about, it's a way of life here in Buffalo. You know, it's, it's that blue-collar, you know, underdog city kind of mentality that people in Buffalo have. You know, it's not just about, you know, we love, we love our Jack Kemp's and we love our Josh Allen's and we love our Jim Kelly's, but you know, we, we love an underdog. We, we like being, we like going into a playoff game, being the underdog. We like, we like that. We like the, we, we consider that a challenge. You know, we like the idea that we lost, well, we don't like losing four Super Bowls, but we like the idea that people try to make fun of us over it because you know what? We lost four Super Bowls, but our fans are still loyal. Our fans are more rabid than ever. Where a lot of these teams, you know, they win a Super Bowl and then three years later they're they're losers and the fans are nowhere to be found. Here here in Buffalo, we're filling that stadium every year, no matter what our record is. It's 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 incredible. But Bill's fans are just so fanatical about it. Yeah, if you had one thing that you could say to a current Bills fan, like someone that's up and coming, that they're experiencing this this game coming up on Saturday. Uh, I guess you could say someone that's younger, but what would you tell them about how, what it was like back in the nineties? You're experiencing exactly what we experienced in the nineties. This is a team, you know, we saw the Jim Kelly team, you know, they made the playoffs and they took a, took a step back and then they came back again and they finally made it to the Super Bowl. It took them a couple of years to get there, but you could see them building this team. You know, they're bringing in, you know, Thurman Thomas and Cornelius Bennett and, and all these other guys were just, they're just piecing this puzzle together. You can see it happening here. You know, we made the playoffs a couple of years ago under Sean McDermott, took a step back last year. They brought in a rookie quarterback, and now he's back this year in the playoffs, and we've got a great defense. We've put together a really good team here. We got a, I think we're still a couple of players away from winning it all, but you can see this team really coming together. We got a great running back in Devin Singletary. We got a great wide receiver in John Brown. We've got a really good defense with some young players like Tredavious White and Tremaine Edmonds. It looks really promising for the future. So, you know, now's a good time to become a fan if you're young because we haven't been bringing in a lot of fans over the last few years because we just haven't been that good. Yeah, and I can tell that you have a lot of passion for your city and for your team, no matter what the last name of of that city in the football. Speaking of that, you've written many other books. Can you tell the fans of the show about some of your other books? Sure. My book after Buffalo's Forgotten Champions was a book called Rock and the Rock Pile, the Buffalo Bills of the American Football League that uh, I interviewed over 60 players and coaches from the Buffalo Bills American Football League era and put that all together, you know, as one sort of collective biography of the team telling the story from the founding in 1959 all the way through the the merger with the NFL in 1970. Then after that, I wrote a book um, where I partnered with uh, Coach Marv Levy on a book called Game Changers, uh, the greatest plays in Buffalo Bills football history. He and I wrote that together, and that came out around 2007, 2009, 2009. After that, I wrote a book called 100 Things Buffalo Bills Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die. And then I wrote a book, uh, which was a biography of 
Pop Warner, who he at, at one time was the winningest coach in college football history, who lived, who grew up in the town in which I live now, Springville, New York. He uh, grew up here. And so I thought, well, there's an interesting character and he lived locally and it'd be great to write a biography about him. So I wrote about Pop Warner, who, of course, coached Jim Thorpe and Ernie, Ernie Nevers and won many national championships. And currently I'm working on another book about the Buffalo Bills. And so, you know, I've got, uh, this will be my fifth football book. I'm getting there. <laughs> right. And I'll, I'll put links to all the books on the on the show notes too. And I'm going to create a dedicated page for you as well, which is going to be thefootballhistorydude.com slash Jeff Miller. And then I'll go ahead and put that out there for everybody. Is there anywhere else that you'd like the listeners of the show to check out any of your work or anything else about the Buffalo All-Americans? Well, I do have a, a Facebook uh, page dedicated to the Buffalo All-Americans. So they can visit that. Um, just type it into Buffalo All-Americans into your uh, Facebook search engine, I guess, and that'll take you there. And I also have an author page for all my writing, which is uh, Jeffrey J. Miller. If you type that into Facebook um, search engine, you'll it'll take you there. So if you want to visit those sites, you can learn more about my books and what I've done and what I'm interested in and what I'm working on now. And usually if I'm doing a book signing or if I'm doing a podcast or if I'm being on, interviewed for you know, a TV special or something, I let people know what's going on. Awesome, man. And I'll put those in the show notes too so it's easy for everybody to get to in one place. One last thing before we kick it on out of here because you've had an extensive amount of research throughout your days. Let's leave the listeners with one most interesting gridiron knowledge nugget that you've uncovered throughout entire history of your research. What would that be? Gee, that's a tough one. Well, I don't necessarily know if I'm proud of this one, but, um, well, there's two things. I had the pleasure and honor of interviewing the two gentlemen who were the oldest surviving players consecutively. So Jim Ellinger was 99 when he died back in the early um, 2000s. He had played for the Buffalo All or Buffalo Bisons in 1924. And then after him, the next person up was a gentleman named Sam Dana, who played for the New York Yankees football team in 1928. And I interviewed him when he was 100. And he died just a few years ago. So I interviewed both of them. But going back to Ellinger, Ellinger liked to tell, and, and this you'll, you'll find this happens a lot, you know, a lot of the older players would like to say that they played against Jim Thorpe. You know, they, they, for some reason, saying you played against Jim Thorpe kind of gave you some kind of panache. So he would tell people he played for Jim Thorpe, and I truly believe that he believed that he did because his team played the Rock Island Independence, I believe, that year in 1924. I think that was the team. Well, I went back and I did the research, and I discovered that that story was not true. He had never played against Jim Thorpe, but I didn't have the heart to actually say, Jim Nailinger, you never played against Jim Thorpe. So when I wrote the book about that season, I just didn't mention it because you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to discredit the gentleman. You know, I think he truly believed that he played against Jim Thorpe somehow, but he never did. So it's one of those things you discover along the way that a lot of, a lot of the old timers would say they played against somebody or they played with somebody and, Sometimes it's embellished or sometimes it's just misremembered. And I think in this case, it was misremembered. Ellinger was a great guy. He's in our local Hall of Fame here. But um, un unfortunately, he was mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it, as a researcher, you know, that's, that's the thing. You try to find out the truth. You know, what really happened in those days? You, you want to make sure that you're getting everything, you know, accurately. And to be accurate, you have to tell the truth. And you you don't want to you don't want to make a fool of somebody, so I didn't go out of my way to do that. But you know, I, I had to find out whether he did because if he did, it would be great to be able to retell the story in the book. But I couldn't retell the story because it just didn't happen. Right. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing that researchers come across. Yeah, and there's many stories and histories and legends and myths and all those kinds of things throughout the uh, years. But I appreciate someone as yourself who takes the time, dedicates their life to be able to really uncover the the truth behind what's happened in their history. And uh, any one last words you want to give to the fans before I let you go here? <laughs> Put your money on the bill. <laughs> Take the point. All right. Well, again, <laughs> Jeff, thank you for your time. We're out of here. Washoo fire. 
Buffalo All-Americans. Arguably the best team in the NFL in the first two seasons. I mean, talk about a team that I had never even known about until I started researching for this podcast. Never knew there was such a team as the Buffalo All-Americans, let alone arguably the best team those first two years. And then, of course, we had this controversy, 1921 championship. I mean, it's just crazy to think about everything that happened at the beginning of the NFL, well, the American Professional Football Association, that we never even knew about, which is why I wanted to thank Jeff for stopping by on this show to drop those great iron knowledge nuggets with us about the first team, the first NFL team, that is, in the city of Buffalo, because he has a lifetime of knowledge that he was powering over so many articles and books and things like that to try to develop his own books to give us information that it would take us too much time to be able to get on our own. And I think that's what's cool about this, you know, listening to this past hour of a podcast worth. You could sit there and listening to a podcast in basically an hour, get all that information that Jeff has poured through over decades researching, just deliberately looking to find answers. Just like he said, he uncovered different things at the end there about a particular player thinking he played with the legendary Jim Thorpe, when in actuality, he probably didn't. But if Jeff doesn't take the time to do that, nor all these other cool football historians that we've talked to, then we wouldn't know what really happened back in the day. So if you like this show, speaking of back in the day in football, then I ask that you please share it with somebody. Tell them they got to mash that little subscribe button in a podcast player choice so they get the hottest, freshest off the press episodes each and every week. And they keep getting these gridiron knowledge nuggets. Now, next week, if you haven't been looking at the numbers on the episodes, it's going to be the 100th episode of the Football History Dude podcast. And man, it's been a long, fun, hard ride. But I couldn't think of any better guest to bring on the show than the one that I'm going to talk to you about that we're going to talk to next week on the episode. Let's go ahead and break down why I hand-selected this dude for the 100th episode of the Football History Dude podcast. A, he's been an inspiration for me personally when I started the show. Listening to his show many moons ago was the reason, one of the reasons why I was like, hmm, that is so cool how you can go back in history and you can talk about things that you can relive and then you can just teach people about it. B, Speaking of history podcasts, he has one of the most successful history podcasts on the planet, probably the solar system and the universe. I mean, I have no idea how many podcasts out there and planet and that other dang galaxy across the way, but he just tells stories like nobody's business. And finally, I was just blown away when I actually was able to perform this interview, how well He was in tune with football, how much passion he had for it, and how much he knew about the history of the game. Because I didn't really think of him necessarily as just a football guru. The guy I'm talking about is Dan Carlin, host of the Hardcore History Podcast, which I highly recommend you go ahead and check it out, because you will not be disappointed. So make sure you stop by next week to celebrate the 100 episodes of the Football History Dude Podcast. And again, if you haven't subscribed yet, then I ask that you subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player of choice. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, 
and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.